Appreciate it. Uh, so I'm not sure what exactly is in the program for huh? this uh, this session, but we're going to be doing a draft of the uh, Apple II software. You can just, I'll tell you, even if historically. you can it yourself, that's great. I can tell we're in about the sound then. Okay. So feel free. That's great. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we're going to be uh, we're going to be talking about Apple II software that we thought was uh, worthy of adding to a Hall of Fame. Um, with the watchword being, I guess, influential software, and uh, the only requirement being that it has to run on some sort of Apple II. Uh, so uh, if, for instance, uh, and we're doing it draft style, so if, for instance, Chris picks uh, Bacon Taste as his, uh, as his most influential software title for the Apple II, uh, that means that the rest of us cannot choose that title. So uh, there's, a, there's a strategy involved, and uh, there might be some sniping and some infighting happening, and it's all for your entertainment. Uh, so once Becky gets here, uh, and I want her uh, definitely to weigh in, uh, and as her, her perspective is going to be uh, different from my own especially, um, but uh, I'm just going to fill air for a little while uh, and uh, say that we've got on the board, we've got uh, software developers, um, we've got uh, historians, bloggers, um, journalists, podcasters, and me. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm a couple of the above. No. Sing a song. I, I can. Uh, I can do anything but sing a song. Oh, there she is. Uh, All right, we were just rejoicing. yes, yes. I was just introducing everyone on the on the panel, and uh, you were about half of the the items that I that I listed. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> we are going to share a mic if that's all right. Fair enough. Okay. You guys are wired. Ken's got his own. Unless you'd like to share with Ken. No, we're good. Okay. So this, I figured this one's handheld. I can just hand it. I can just hand it. Back in the way. All right. So um, without further, uh, I think I need to turn it on if you haven't. There you go. All right. So without further ado, um, welcome to the, I guess, inaugural uh, Apple II Software Hall of Fame uh, roundtable. So uh, I'm going to kick it off with, uh, we're going to go in this order with uh, Chris Torrance. Peter Ferry, Ken Gagney, Berger Becky, and myself, I'm Charles Mangan, and that's the order we're gonna go in. So Chris, kick it off with you, uh, with uh, your first pick, if you will. All right, I feel like this is really loud. Is that very better? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, it's not too loud? I wanna hear you. All right, all right, so my first pick is, um, actually Olympic Decathlon. Ooh. So that was released by, I believe, Microsoft. I'm not sure exactly what year. It must have been 1982 or maybe even earlier, because uh, I think I got it with my computer. Um, and I really like that one just because it, I think it is a simulation. So it was the first game that I played where it was actually trying to simulate like reality and so you know you can imagine the arcade games with like asteroids and you know space invaders but that's not something that obviously you would encounter in real life whereas Olympic decathlon you could kind of put yourself into the shoes of someone like uh, I guess at the time it was Bruce Jenner um, and just imagine yourself as this star athlete and of course me being a nerdy kid who couldn't really play sports that you know was this amazing thing to imagine that I could, you know, be pole vaulting or throwing a javelin. Um, and so my brother and I would just spend hours and hours mashing on the one and two keys to try and be the fastest <laughs> one. Um, and it's also a game that I think anybody can kind of pick up without a lot of, you know, knowledge about computer games. In fact, we had a party just a couple of years ago at my house and we invited like 50 people and there was a bunch of kids. And so I brought out my Apple IIe and hooked it up to the uh, you know the TV in our living room, and I had Olympic decathlon going, and there was all these teenagers, you know, ranging from like 12 years old up to 18, and they were all had so much fun playing Olympic decathlon, and it was it was just a blast. So I think it's like a timeless game, um, 
and that's my pick. How many keyboards did you go through? Yeah, uh, uh, Especially those teenagers. Yes. The, it, I think all the keys actually survived. So although they, I was a little annoyed because one of them actually beat my high score because I, I did keep track of all of my scores from back in the day and I still have the score sheet. But Anybody yeah. else want to weigh in real quick? Olympic decathlon? No, I mean, my, I have three older brothers, and my youngest brother and I would play that game all the time. And it's definitely a precursor to the Konami franchise, Track and Field, which was very popular mm -hmm. in the arcades and then later on Ape and Nintendo. It's the same button mashing strategy that you know, works so well, especially not just that, but also calculating angles for the javelin mm -hmm. and the like. So there's math, there's timing, there's repetition. It's a lot of very different physical and mathematical skills. Right. Cool. Peter, Fair enough. your first pick? Uh, my first pick is uh, Degeneration. It uh, was unreleased for the Apple II, but it ended up uh, being released on the PC and became very popular. Uh, one of the things I like about it is it was probably the first of the sneaker games where if you ran in with guns blazing, you might end up not being able to complete the level. So instead you have to take a look at the level first, get a sense of what you have to do before you actually try and do any of it. And it also pioneered some of the the uh, graphical techniques we saw in some demos. Uh, so there's translucence in uh, in some of the objects, which we saw in uh, the following years, uh, what they call glens, and uh, even uh, deformed objects, which uh, became the beast line uh, Rubber techniques. It was just amazing. Uh, so. Degeneration, anyone else? Anybody? Uh, who played that? I, I've never played that one myself. Oh. I don't think I ever even heard of it. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, I've never heard of it. Played it? Okay. Well. <laughs> Obviously sad. influential in a different way. Yeah, well, it went on to influence things like Metal Gear Solid, which yeah. is, yeah. Uh, and Thief, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, they, they are certainly well known. <laughs> yeah. So, so even though we haven't played it, we should play it. Yes. Okay. It's the grandfather of the games you might have played, <laughs> and you never so even knew. Sounds great. Oh, right. Ken, you want your first pick? Sure. Thank you. So I am going to continue the trend of selecting a game, and my game of choice would be Load Runner, uh, the classic Broderbund published game by Doug E. Smith. I love this game. I love the primary colors. It's basically red, white, and blue as you're running around trying to capture all that gold that the... What, do, do the enemies have a name? Bungling Empire. The Bungling Empire, because the sprites are the same as Raid on Bungling Bay, which was an 8-bit Nintendo game I absolutely loathed. Like, <laughs> when I rented that game, I cried because I'd wasted so much money on renting that game. Like, one rental a week and this is it, and I have to play it. Crap. Because you play games you don't like because you have nothing else to do. Uh, but Load Runner, I loved. And one of the things I liked was that I remember when my dad got an accelerator card. I don't remember if it was a zip chip or a trans warp or something else, but he installed it and the game got faster and my reactions did not. So it was basically like a new difficulty setting for the game where if I wanted to play it on fast or slow mode, just like Ms. Pac-Man in the arcade, you control dip switches to choose how fast you want the game to be. And so I learned to play the game at fast speed, and it was so much fun. Uh, I also discovered through on my own that if you push Control E on the main title screen, you get a level select, as well as perhaps a level editor. I don't remember that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and like this was a secret that I traded at school to the other kids who were playing Load Runner. Like, hey, if you don't beat me up, maybe I'll show you how to get to level 100. You know, uh, it worked once, and then after that, I had nothing to trade with, so they went back to beating me up. But for that one time, that one day, that one moment, I was cool. And then I got to go home and play Load Runner, so that was cool. Oh, and I also like that it is a, it is a franchise that continues to this day. Like, there is a new Load Runner Legacy game that just came out for Steam and Nintendo Switch. There was a game for the Xbox 360 a few years ago that had two-player co-op that I learned that uh, Juice GS Associate Editor Andy Malloy is terrible at. And uh, it, that was fun, too, because it's Load Runner. And it can't not be fun. Oh. Yeah, Load Runner was definitely on my list, mostly because of the, the early level editor being able to create your own levels as part of a meta game, um, and the fact that it's still relevant today. I mean, you still see it referenced as um, 
you know, again, the watchword of influ influential on people's gaming careers and, and uh, careers in um, creating games. Hmm. Yeah, it's been a frequent nominee to the Video Game Hall of Fame at the International Center for the History of Electronic Games, part of the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. It hasn't been inducted yet, but I think that's an oversight on their part and one I hope will be corrected. Well, now it's in the Apple II Software Hall of Fame. Becky? All right, my uh, first one would have to be Castle Wolfenstein Yay. by Silas Warner. Yeah. Um, the game with a simple preface premise. Nazis are bad. Something we're dealing with again. Um, but, you know, the speech synthesis where the uh, Nazis show up and go and, so, you know, at the time the game was came out, that was just unheard of. I think only Apple Talker was the only time it actually had voice synthesis on the Apple II. And this is like, as I'm understanding it, it's the first game to actually use voice synthesis um, as part of the gameplay. Um, and of course, Castle Wolfenstein has spawned its own franchise, and it's mm -hmm. still around even today. Cool. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, no. I would. I would completely agree with Castle Wolfenstein. I, in fact, I, as a kid, I wasn't very good at it, but mm -hmm. I made myself the challenge of trying to finish it. And so, just like a couple years ago, I ended up, you know, playing through the whole thing just on my Apple IIe and made it all the way to Field Marshal and was very happy to do that and in fact Mark Limert is now wasting I mean uh, <laughs> spending all of his valuable KFS time doing the same thing right yeah, so I'm playing it on the the um, the big screen in the lobby yep mm -hmm. learning all the tricks I've never been very good at it so learning tricks is good yeah. I think Castle Wolfenstein is another game that influenced Metal Gear Solid it was one of the first stealth action games and that speech synthesis that Becky was talking about, I found terrifying. If I was playing early on Saturday morning while the rest of my family was asleep, and a German guard burst in and suddenly started yelling at me, I would turn the computer off, because I just wanted him to go away. And I knew that was the only way to do it. Also, if I believe, this was the first game to ever be modded when they made Castle Smurfenstein. <laughs> so that is another contribution to its legacy. Yeah, definitely an early modded game, yeah. Yeah, I don't know that the mic stand is... Uh, oh, there you go. You got it. Um, well, I'm going to break the trend of picking games, and I'm going to choose ADT Pro by David Schmidt mm -hmm. um, as uh, one of my very first Apple II acquisitions didn't come with any software. Uh, the floppy drive had nothing to do uh, until I gave it some um, uh, some data to burn on, to put on a burn onto a disc, but to, to put onto a disc via ADT Pro. Uh, and I think that's a lot of people's path into um, both ripping floppies into disc image, but also in getting disc images from the internet onto their Apple II. And uh, it technically fits their requirements because the client software runs on the Apple II while the, the server software runs on your Mac or PC. Um, yeah, you can get discs from the internet onto bare metal with nothing but an audio cable and uh, ADT Pro, and um, that gets a lot of people kickstarted into playing their favorite games from the from the old days. Mm -hmm. Cool. I see head nods. Anybody else? Yeah? All right. So that was round one. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but uh, let's go ahead and jump into round two with Chris. All right. Number two. Number two uh, is actually Crush, Crumble, and Chomp. What? So this is a Epix, E-P-Y-X game. Uh, I actually just picked up this copy uh, from the Garage Giveaway. I already have a copy at home. Uh, so if anybody actually wants this, this looks like a really clean copy. You can grab it from me afterward. Um, so the premise of this game is you are a monster like Godzilla or uh, some sort of terrible lizard creature winged thingamabob and you actually get to create your own monster and you go around and terrorize a city and knock down buildings and burn up police cars and it's awesome <laughs> can i see that yeah and um i don't know there's something about that game just this uh, leaving a trail of destruction behind you is just too much fun um, but of course in the end there's pesky humans, they always get you, and the mad scientist will invariably swoop down on his helicopter 
and zap you with some sort of radioactive spray <coughs> and then you'll die some horrible agonizing monster death. But the goal was to eat as many people as possible and last as long as possible. And I don't know, I just really enjoyed it. I don't know how influential it was. Um, I think there was a lot of games actually that uh, Epic's created after that. I think there was actually, um, there's uh, some sort of, I forget the name of it, there's some other game that was based on this one that came afterward. Monster Movie Monster, yes. Um, so it was very influential in terms of like future games, but in terms of this particular title, I don't know how well it actually sold. So that's my... It pick. influenced you and that's enough. Exactly. And there are several monsters you can choose to play as, including the Glob, Goshzilla, and Arachnus. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a strategic take on Rampage. Could be. Oh. All right, Peter. And my next pick would be Karataka. Mm. <laughs> the head-to-head uh, -head action, uh, obviously resulted in games we see later, like Street Fighter. And uh, yeah, I've played endlessly on this one, especially the, the bird being such a, a nuisance. <laughs> and uh, yeah, kick through the door and immediately get kicked by Akuma because he can't see him right away. That was uh, always a challenge, but uh, yeah, I love that game. If you haven't already, uh, definitely listen to the interview with uh, George Good Mechner Megan, yeah. on, is it called Apple Time Warp, yep. yes. the podcast John with John Romero. Yeah, he, uh, he talks uh, really beautifully about the idea of telling a story with a game that has a beginning, middle, and an end, and it's a game, it's not an arcade game that's supposed to take your quarter after quarter and you just keep playing forever until you run out of money. It's a, uh, it's a great um, departure from what came before it. And yeah, definitely, uh, that was another one that was on my short list, so that's two of mine sniped. <laughs> I'm sorry. But isn't it Karateka? He pronounced it Karateka. Yeah. <laughs> I'm especially a fan of the two-player mode. Yes, I was going to Oh yeah, we'll hear about too. that tomorrow. Yes. Oh okay. uh, yeah, unless anyone else has uh, thoughts on Karateka, or Karateka, or Karate Ka? <laughs> no, okay. I'm going to go with another game. This one is a 16-bit game, and that would be Dueltris. Uh, I'm a big fan of Steve Chang's Dueltris. It is a high-speed, two-player, competitive version of Tetris. It has some original innovations, which I suppose is redundant, uh, of, like power-ups that you can use to lower your stack of blocks. And there have been a lot of variations on Tetris over the years, and not all of them work. Like sometimes they try to add different shaped pieces and that just messes with the basic formula too much to the point that they're sacrificing gameplay just to be different. Dueltris actually works. And the soundtrack is amazing. Like the, the fact that you can play this game with this amazing soundtrack blasting at you is fantastic. Uh, the guy who wrote it went on to be like lead game de developer. No, I think he was like CEO of Zynga. Uh, the company that made Farmville, I believe. And he's doing other stuff now, and it's just remarkable the trajectory of his career and how it began with one of the best Apple II GS games, in my opinion. I would love to see a dual trust competition at Kansas Fest. Uh, that's something that I was pushing for about 15 years ago. Hasn't happened since. Maybe I should be the one to make it happen. Um, the next game I'm going to uh, choose is Wizardry. Um, I'm an RPG fan, and um, before Wizardry came out, I played Dungeons and Dragons with friends, so we'd have our weeknight, um, once a week we'd get together, play some D&D, &D, and all of a sudden this game came out for the Apple II, which is about the closest thing you could be playing a D&D &D game without actually having a bunch of friends. And its entire game design was modeled uh, by everyone else, like Might and Magic, Bard's Tale, uh, the SSI Goldbox games, all can trace their roots to wizardry. And that's another one that had a whole uh, load of uh, the whole franchise. Thank you for the word. Sorry, brain <laughs> not work good. Um, yeah, a whole franchise after it with sequels and and takeoffs, and it you know went multi-platform and everything else. So yeah, that was um, you know, being uh, sort of the innovator, and everyone copied it. Yeah. yeah, Wizardry Labyrinth of Souls just came out for PS4. 
PlayStation 4 this summer, so it's still a franchise that's alive and well. And it's remarkable that for some reason that franchise really took off in Japan. And there have been a lot of Wizardry games released over there that we haven't seen. Yeah. Plus, that game was somewhat unique at the time because there was all those kind of Easter eggs or cheats that you could do, which I, don't, I think they were actually bugs. But uh, you know, for example, when you could get the hundred million Tomato experience tomato. points, and yes, exactly. Um, so that was really interesting to find out that there actually were the, you know these flaws in the games that could somehow give you you know extra powers and things. So wizardry is on the board. Um, to wrap up round two, I am going to I'm going to pick a little uh, a little one, um, a little tiny uh, utility. Not even a utility. It has no utility at all. It's uh, it's Apple Vision from Bob Bishop. Um, it has uh, high res sprite graphics, um, a high res character generator. Um, music and animation at the same time. Um, it looks like it's mixed mode between high res and, and text, which blew people's minds. Even though it's it's all high res, um, the uh, the the demo was something that he made, and then Apple picked up and distributed, and they didn't really give him much, and you know, in the way of you know credit or anything other than you know it's on the disc, and then. Eventually, he got a job out of it, and uh, you know he went on to, to bigger and better things. But the um, the the influence of that showing up on a on your DOS disk when you boot up your Apple II in 1981, it's, uh, it's just mind blowing. And how many people tried to emulate it or tried to create their own animation with sound and try to get those you know those two things happening. Um, Simultaneously, or figured out by disassembling his code, and, and you know, kind of created uh, a generation of people that, you know, if they were interested, they had something to emulate and something to uh, to, uh, to inspire them. And now we have streaming video. <laughs> and now we have streaming video. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anybody else weighing in on round two? All right. So, uh, how are we for time? Well, yeah. we're, I think we're good till seven forty-five. Oh, great. Oh, I thought it was seven forty. So the time was for an hour for the thing before. I'm not sure if that was different than what we have now, but you can go on. You got lots of time. Okay. Well, if uh, if everybody's ready, we'll do a round three. Yeah. Round okay. three, go. All right, round three. Uh, well, I guess since Mark Kolzarski just entered the room, I really should pick a Penguin software title, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so my next title is uh, not influential and. It's actually, I sound very quiet. Um, it's actually somewhat controversial um, and an annoying little game called Firebug. Uh, but this is actually a Silas Warner game. Um, and surprisingly, it came out after Castle Wolfenstein uh, because it's low res. Um, it looks pretty junky, uh, but it's actually highly addictive to the point where there was a, a, a district, a school district in Michigan that actually banned the game because they thought it encouraged people to commit arson. Because the, the premise of the game is that you're this little pig with a tail and your tail is on fire and you're wandering through a maze and you're trying to basically outrun your tail on fire while at the same time burning down the building. So I guess since my last pick was crushed, I, I must have this thing about destroying things. Um, but the, the interesting quirk to the game is it was actually kind of a maze. So you were trying to find your way <coughs> through a maze really quickly. You had to solve the maze so that you didn't get trapped. And then you could pick up little gas cans. This little pig could pick up gas cans and then drop them along the way because you had to kind of strategically do that so that you could burn down all of the floor and get the most points. And then if you did that, then you went on to the next floor of the hotel and you burned down that floor. I'm not sure which way you were going. Hopefully you were going down. Um, and it was just, I don't know, it was just this really highly addictive game that was just a lot of fun to play and um, probably nobody else has heard of it. I've heard it. Sorry. No. I've heard of it. It was actually a fun game. Mm -hmm. Peter? Uh, my next choice is Rescue Raiders. Um, Probably the first real-time strategy game that influenced things like Command and Conquer. 
where you have to rent resources, you have to you know, buy equipment, and there's essentially a time limit that uh, the longer you take, the fewer points you get because the the cost of war goes up as you as you go along. So the faster you finish the war, the the lesser costs, but still, um, it has a message that that, that uh, war is expensive, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I could spend a long time talking about the strategy that, uh, that I used to defeat that. But uh, or, or you could just cheat. <laughs> uh, different versions had different uh, passwords for the, the cheat codes, yeah. and so you'd know if you had a cracked version versus the original because. The the crack has changed the the, uh, the password, but uh, yeah, it was, um, I mean the the whole idea of a real time strategy is still going today, so it's uh, long lived. Is this game related to Choplifter? The helicopter design is very similar, but uh, it's uh, head to head, uh, so there's a, an enemy helicopter, who also has an army of vehicles and people who are attempting to blow up your base oh. while you're attempting to do the same. Mm. So it's real-time strategy, real-time strategy meets side-scrolling helicopter game. Yes. Most yes. of the real-time strategy stuff ends up looking like a you know, a top-down RPG kind of a kind of a thing, but right, they, they changed the view yeah. when they had more resources to mm -hmm. uh, to do that. But uh, side scroll was the fastest way of of implementing it on an AP machine. Cool. Cool. Right, next. So following the rule of threes, having chosen two games, I'm now going to deviate and go with Violatrix, which is a classic desk accessory, a CDA for the Apple IIGS from Carl Bunker from my own Massachusetts. And this is a uh, ability to just enter into the menu from anywhere in the Apple IIGS and do stuff like copy, rename, delete, view text files. It's a great file utility that you can access from anywhere. So when I was you know, running ProTerm or Spectrum or Appleworks or playing a game, and I just suddenly had to look something up, or if I want to like copy my save data in the game before I died, I could go ahead and do all that. And it was great, especially when I was running at BBS. Warp 6 saves a lot of its data in text files. And so I could view those text files <coughs> while I was running the BBS, or even if I was in chat with somebody, if I, I as the sysop, somebody popped in a chat with me and they asked, hey, how come you know the, the, I can't find this file, or where is this? I can just pop into that CDA and go browsing through all my files and directories and locate it or rename it or put it somewhere that he needs to access it, all without leaving that chat. So Filatrix was a great tool. How are you spelling that? F-I-L-E hyphen A hyphen T-R-I-X. It, it sounds like not many people have heard of this tool. I, I use it all the time. Cool, you got three users. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned Carl Bunker. Is Bunker where in the public domain yet? Uh, so Carl Bunker, if I recall, had a website. It was like Iron Software, I think was the name of his company. And at some point, he did release all his tools to the public domain because they used to be shareware. I think that was the last update he made to his software was a minor update to change the text in it. So I think that is something he did. Uh, I remember sending in my shareware fee uh, as a check with a note saying like what program or what language did you program this in because I wanted to grow up to be a programmer at that point in my life. And he actually wrote back and said I wrote it in assembly. And I was like oh maybe that's something I should learn and I didn't. But I, at least I got to pay the shareware fee before he decided no more shareware fees were necessary. So, so a GS utility. I'm going to go for a GS utility as well. Pointless. The, um, before Pointless was around, uh, the Apple IIGS had distinctive fonts that when you printed out anything that we created on your IIGS, it had very blocky images and it didn't look anywhere near as nice as what people were doing on the Macintosh. But then once Pointless was released, all of a sudden 
uh, documents being printed out on an Apple II GS were indistinguishable from the Macintosh, which, as I understand from Apple Corporate, pissed them off immensely. <laughs> so kudos to them for creating Pointless. Always a plus if you can uh, bite the hand that, uh, that makes the Apple. Um, anyone else use uh, Pointless on their GS for printing and stuff? Yeah, a few people, a few people, good. I never got I, I never got into the GS, so I, I the uh, the desktop utilities and things uh, passed me by. All right, my uh, my next pick, um, I'm gonna go with uh, Passport from 4 a.m. Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, another recent addition to the uh, uh, pantheon of cracking tools for the uh, the Apple II and uh, for the 8-bits, but the um, uh, the thing that makes it special is uh, not only is it uh, in the modern era, but it works on original hardware uh, with your original disks and you can crack stuff automatically. Uh, it's constantly being updated and it's feature set added to. Uh, I, I joke that it has uh, become self-aware and will start cracking software on its own before you even approach it, but the author tells me that is not the case, so we can all rest a I little easier tonight. You would say that. What's that? You would say that. You would say that. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it just as a as a model for modern development, it's being done uh, collaboratively with a team of uh, programmers and with modern tools, but um, sent down through the time tunnel to the 8 bit 6502 and running its code on original hardware and cracking floppies like uh, it could have been made in the 80s. Mm. All right, so that is that's round three. Um, I told everyone to prepare at least three things, and I feel like we've gotten through round three. Uh, this is this is the point in, um, and I just want to say I stole this format from a podcast called The Incomparable. So if you ever listen to The Incomparable, at the end of their draft shows, they they do a bring out your dead. So last round, um, uh, anything that you want to mention that has not yet been mentioned, um, go ahead and bring it out now. Anything that you um, you want to comment on further that's already been mentioned or um, something that uh, you feel needs to be brought out into the light, please do. So start with Chris. Bring out your dead. All right. Um, I guess maybe I don't think it would be fair to leave here without actually mentioning Choplifter. I think we mentioned it a couple times, um, but specifically as a game, you talked earlier about uh, the interview with Jordan Mechner, and he actually called out uh, Choplifter as being heavily influential on him and it was kind of his sudden realization that you actually could create games with a story and they didn't have to just be shoot 'em ups and I think that that's a perfect example of that you know your goal is to rescue the people and shooting things it you may have to along the way but it's sort of incidental and I think that was kind of a game that combined those kind of elements really perfectly so that's what I would throw out there uh, I'd love to mention VisiCalc yeah. because it's uh, it went on to influence just about everything, about Excel and and uh, and sheets and other things. And uh, yeah, it, it laid the groundwork for the spreadsheet in general. It's, uh, it was an amazing uh, achievement to get it to work on the 8-bit machine at all. And uh, yeah, I still use I still use a variant of it today. So. <laughs> Uh, I have three more utilities on my list, depending on how many people sniped me. Uh, they included ShadowWrite, which is the NDA for the Apple II GS that is a basically a word processor, also known as Herms or Hermes. And then I also had uh, Quit2, which is another CDA by Carl Bunker that basically when you quit a program, it immediately launches the next program that you select instead of going back to the Finder or to a ProDOS 8 booter. Uh, but the top utility I was going to mention next was GS Shrinkit which allows you to archive files and put everything into one volume. Uh, because, like most people, I was really enjoying the online aspects of the Apple II. I was dialing into BBSs, running my own, dialing into CompuServe, Genie, and Delphi. And I was downloading every single game that was uploaded to the games library on CompuServe. You know, I would type go app user, 
and then go into the library for games and just download everything, everything. And none of that would have been possible if it hadn't been archived somehow. You know, Windows had zip files, there was another platform that had ARC files, Mac had SIT files, and we had SHK and BXY. And I, it was just invaluable, both the Apple II version, the 8-bit, and especially for me, the GS version, GS Shrink It. For me, I'm going to pick two GS games that I found that just really inspired me to be better. The Immortal and Zany Golf. Because both of those games were just so well done and were from the ground up designed for the 2GS. And they really showed off what the Apple 2GS could do. Uh, I'm just going to say it because I know that uh, it's going to get mentioned before uh, I leave the room, and it's going to be uh, uh, something that people probably have already thought of and dismissed because they figured someone else picked it. And I'm going to say Oregon Trail. Um, everybody's nodding their head. Yes, Oregon Trail was on my uh, on my list. Um, for me, the one of the games that got me uh, really hooked on playing games and reading them reading stories in general is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and that kind of represents for me all of the Infocom games, but um, it was one of their most popular and got a lot of people into not only uh, interactive fiction or Infocom games, but uh, sitting down at a computer and working out puzzles and you know trying new things as opposed to just shooting aliens. And uh, the text adventure games um, were a big part of uh, big part of my childhood, and so they influenced me. And then I got into the books from there, and that's been a big, big influence on my taste in science fiction and comedy, and uh, got me reading and all kinds of things. So Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxies, uh, my last uh, Bring Out Your Dead. Um, we've got quite a list here. Um, I'll go through it real quick, and then uh, we can open it up to anybody from the audience that wants to comment or have a question, and then we'll probably have, we have something at 8, or at 7.45, you said? 8 o'clock is uh, Solderfest. Oh, Solderfest is in here, so we're going to have to have some time to set up. So, um, the uh, class of 2019 Apple II Software Hall of Fame, according to our panelists, is uh, Olympic Decathlon. Crush, Crumble, and Chomp, and Firebug from Chris Torrance. Degeneration, Karateka. Rescue Raiders from Peter Ferry. Load Runner, Dualtris, and File a Tricks from Ken Gagney. Uh, Rebecca Heineman picked Castle Wolfenstein, Wizardry, and Pointless for the GS. And my picks were ADT Pro. Uh, Apple Vision and Passport with a number of honorary mentions in the uh, Bring Out Your Dead round. Hmm. Anybody from the audience want to uh, comment or question or yes? <laughs> you, can, you can nominate if you want to. You can nominate for next year. <coughs> I was really surprised nobody mentioned Breakout by Steve Wozniak. Breakout by Steve Wozniak. Definitely influential. A lot of people probably listed that and edited it and modded it and tried to figure out how to work and, and uh, make their own. I mean, it's certainly of hi historical significance. I would rather play Arkanoid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised, Charles, that of all of us up here, you're the only one whose top three picks didn't include any games. <laughs> Apple Vision's kind of a... No. <laughs> I wanted to go away from games because I knew that they would be a very popular category and I wanted to try and and uh, bring up things that were influential in other ways and so yeah, I'm glad that some utilities and things that were non-games came up as well and uh, <coughs> so that's good and if you want to play if you want to play Passport as a meta game you can do that <laughs> anybody else have a comment from here? Uh, obviously I didn't grow up with Games, but I was kind of surprised that Adventure wasn't it up here. Adventure? Colossal Cave. Yeah. Or Colossal Cave, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking Scott, of Scott Adams Adams as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I, I, I... I tried to generalize which text adventure I wanted to to, uh, to nominate, and so I, I picked Hitchhiker's Guide myself, because that was, the, that was the one that I spent probably the most time on, me and my friends. 
Is there one in the back, Kevin? Friggin' Visicout. He said, he said oh, Friggin' Visicout. That was in the... Yeah. <laughs> it was in the honor. It was in the honorary mentions, but yes, friggin' Visicalc. And over here, Apple DOS. Apple mm. beat everybody else in market share for two years before your A, Commodore, or anybody else had DOS. So Apple beat everybody to the market, gained market share, and without Apple DOS, you might not be. There you go, Apple DOS. A uh, nomination from the gallery uh, maybe it'll come up in the class of 2020 but uh, yeah, if yeah. you want to participate in uh, in next year's uh, panel discussion we'll uh, we'll be here then uh, I see one more hand from the back Did somebody mention the print shop the print shop no it was not mentioned the print shop literally drove printer sales yeah. and here you can track popularity of print shops and printer sales in parallel. For the folks on the stream that couldn't hear that, that was a um, uh, comment from the gallery. Mark saying <coughs> print shop drove the, the sales of printers and you can match the, uh, the rise and fall of printer sales based on how popular print shop was. Hmm. You know, I, I kind of wish I had mentioned ProTerm which mm -hmm. is a fantastic telecom t utility. Uh, and, but then I eventually moved from that to Spectrum, which was not only a great GS telecom util program, but also had a great scripting language. And I consider it one of the two languages besides BASIC that I ever felt comfortable programming in. When I needed to convert a straight HTML website into WordPress and into a data format, a structured data format that could be imported into a content management system, I wrote a Spectrum script to do it. Because I didn't know any other language, and I knew Spectrum could do it, and it did. Um, I don't know. I mean, for my opinion, I would have had covered Mirror because mm. it was a text uh, adventure game, and also it had graphics. Graphical text first, adventure games, yeah. 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 First graphic text adventure game. There you go. Coveted Mirror. How could I forget Microzine? Like all of the all 36 issues. They had so many great games just like that, a blend of text and graphics. I loved it. All right. Four issues. What? I'm missing four? Don't tell me that. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right, I think last one, and then they're going to kick us out so that we can uh, get Soderfest set up. The Emon franchise. Mm. Uh, Emon That's Adventures, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Roll, roll your own adventure games. Yeah, definitely. Um, some authors probably got started there writing their own adventure games in that framework and then went on from there to do custom work. And you can still explore the Eamon's Adventurer Guild online, mm -hmm. Eamon AG dot something, uh, run by Matthew Clark. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I want to thank you guys for sticking around and uh, for joining us for the uh, inaugural Hall of Fame draft and uh, our panelists, uh, Chris, Peter, Ken, and Becky, and myself. Uh, I'm Charles, and uh, I turn you back over to Dr. Steve. Yay.